down to uh, the Gospel Project. August 1st, baby. We made it. Fall's almost here. Who's excited? Woo. No one. <laughs> no one. No one. Even as we enter the month of August, we're making our way through the book of James. If you were here last week, you may, have, you may remember uh, we talked about the, the relationship between faith and works. And how important it is to understand that and how in many traditions and ideas, uh, confusion and distortion can set in. And we can really miss the truth and reality of the gospel when we don't understand the relationship between faith and works. If you remember, some would assume that when it comes to salvation, uh, faith plus works is what matters. As if they both go together to save us. Faith plus works is what matters. Or uh, in response to that, or maybe as the pendulum would swing the other way, many would conclude that faith minus works is what's significant when it comes to salvation. As if works have nothing to do with our salvation at all. And I presented to you what I think would be the most biblical position based on what we read last week in the book of James. It's faith with an arrow that leads to works. That saving faith inevitably, essentially leads to works. That's what's important for us to remember. And James is wanting to correct the error that you can just have bare assent, and that will save you, as if works have nothing to do with it. Our good works in response that evidence and manifest this faith are as important, is, are, are important for us as believers. And so James continues in chapter 3 today. Grab your Bibles, open up to James 3. James continues in chapter 3 to get at our response to the gospel, to get at the fruit of faith, the manifestation of faith. He's talking about the works that are the overflow, the fruit of faith, if that makes any sense. And he's talking about something more specific today. He talked about works in general last week, and now today he's going to transition to emphasize a specific area of our lives that should be prioritized, hit to the top of the list for us, as those who have faith in Christ, who have saving faith in Jesus Christ. If you trust in Jesus, you will have works that evidence that trust in Jesus. And to be specific about those works, he's going to teach us concretely today. He's going to point to a main area of our lives that must be prioritized, that go to the top of the list. A work that is a mark of Christian maturity. Even there for a moment, I should pause. James writes in a way that if you look at it and feel it, he writes with such focus and passion about the maturation of the Christian. Verse 3, he hits it right away. Respond with joy to trials. Why? God uses them to perfect his own. Perfection, lacking in nothing, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. It is a priority of James that his readers be mature, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I wonder if all the ambitions and desires and pursuits of our lives, where does maturation in Christ, the maturing of our faith, where does that priority and passion just in general, where does that hit our, our mindset in life. Let me say it simpler. 
Are you passionately in pursuit of Christian maturity? Is that your ultimate aim, to be like Jesus? That's what James wants. James wants. Wants us to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He wants to encourage us into Christian maturity. He wants to keep that vision, that horizon, that that's where you're headed. One day you'll see him face to face and you will be like him. That that's where saving faith that leads to works leads us eventually. Isn't that amazing vision to think about? That one day we will be like Christ. Is that a dream, a vision, and therefore a passionate priority for you? It's easy for other things to come in and to leak in and to take over and to propel us every single day. But that's what God's purpose is. That we become like Christ. He is not done with you as his child. Amen? Okay, so... All that being said, where do we start? James tells us, James chapter 3, 1 through 12. If the introduction has any bearing on the length of this message, may God have mercy on your souls. (laughs) James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Listen to what he says. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. There's that word again. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also... The tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring Pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grape vine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord and all God's people said. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We ask that your spirit would speak to us. That the word and the truth therein would pierce us mature us, strengthen us, and guide us today. We need it. Feed us, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been a pastor for 17 years. Time is flying in life. It's crazy to think about it. It's crazy to think over the last 17 years how many times somebody has come to me, and, 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 and maybe it's a church planting thing or whatever, but you, you get certain folks that come to the church and immediately you get to know them, and it, and it takes about 4.2 seconds to hear their passion. I want to teach. I want to teach. And, and, and I always am amazed by that. I, I kind of go, okay, great. What do you want to teach? It's almost like, I don't even care. I just want to teach. What do you want to teach? Uh, who do you want to teach? Anyone. Anything or anyone. I just want to teach. You follow me? There's within people this desire to just be in front of people. Again, I'm being a little skeptical and cynical right now. You understand where I'm coming from. Some people, and I praise God for them, have a pure motive. 
They love the word and they want to share the word because they understand that it has a transforming impact on people's lives. Amen? But there's an interesting thing that takes place where so many people are. Uh, so many, I've seen young men just scratch. I want to teach. I want to preach. I want to teach. I want to preach. Who? I don't know. Where? I don't know. What? I don't know. Just want to teach. There's this uh, assuming, a desiring, a scratching for platform and position. I mean, to be fair, it was 17 years ago that I was feeling the same thing. Right? Uh, uh, some of us tell me, you should probably be a youth pastor, dude. You're like 20. Four, and you look like you're six. <laughs> Should probably be a youth pastor. I'm like, youth pastor, hey, listen, praise God for youth ministry, but I ain't doing no more lock ins. Too old for that at 24. Too old. I said, I feel called to preach. Yeah, somebody can get behind that. I feel called to preach. Where? I don't care. <laughs> what? I don't care. The Bible? Anything in it? So I understand, right? You feel a sense of calling. You want to be a part of something. You want to, you want to see the Word of God uh, uh, change people's lives. But Paul's, or yeah, Paul, James is saying, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. There's almost a caution in James. Not many of you should do this. Beware of pursuing this. You have to understand that while the temptation is to, to scratch and claw for some sort of influence and position, beware of that. Because you understand that you will be judged with a greater strictness. I can't help but think about what took place in the ministry of, of Mars Hill Church in Mark Driscoll, as you saw that church over a period of 15 to 17 years uh, come under the, the leadership of a very young man who had an amazing gift and who seemed to lack the necessary character. He had charisma, but did he have character to really lead and influence? And we saw over time the character would come out and all of a sudden the crash and burn of a massive megachurch, which is such a tragedy and I wonder if some of these words here would not bear weight on a situation like that. The point is, is that we should approach the role and the task of teaching with a profound sense of humility. Given what James says, you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. I feel a weight when I read that. It's a, it's a heaviness. There's a fear that comes with that. But he goes on to say that this caution is not just because of the greater judgment and the greater strictness that will come, but he goes on to say that we all stumble in many ways. Whether we're aspiring to be a teacher or not, there is a universal struggle with stumbling. To maybe put it in theological terms, we all fall into sins, don't we? And I wonder if we would all feel the weight of that today. We all stumble in many ways. It's a universal reality that none of us escape. We all stumble in many ways. All of us in multi-varied, uh, just infinite, we're, we're like in, it, we're inventors of ways to sin. We come up with new ways to sin constantly. In many ways, it's all the same, right? We're just doing what our, what our fathers did. We keep doing the same things over and over again. But I wonder if all of us could, could just come to that verse for a second and sit there and say, we all stumble in many ways and feel the weight of that. And I wonder if that even affects you this morning. If just thinking about the fact that we all stumble in many ways, do you even feel that? that, that does that do anything to you today? Does it promote any humility the recognition that you stumble and you sin. But he goes on to be concrete about it. He says one way that we stumble is in what we say. He's talking about our words. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. There's that word perfect again. Maturation. 
perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If he's saying, if you do not stumble, if you do not sin in what you say, you're on a path to maturity. And you're able to bridle your whole body. If you can control your tongue, if you can bridle your tongue, you, you're mature. You can control your whole self. He's telling us that a mature faith manifests itself in a controlled mouth. I want you to hear that today. Trust Jesus. I'm growing in Jesus. Pursuing Jesus. If you're saying those things, connect those dots to that statement. Because a mature faith manifests itself in a controlled mouth. Who we are and who we are becoming is reflected in what we say. I'll just be honest, I feel like I'm preaching with a limp today. Someone asked me how, if I was okay before the service. I'm like, bro, I'm fine. But I feel, I feel in conviction today. I feel confronted today by the Lord and His Word. I still feel loved, right? But I feel confronted today. I preach with a limp. It's, it, you, I'm being asked today to, to teach authoritatively on sanctified speech. It's almost like asking me to teach people how to design a safe bridge. Like, am I an expert in this? Absolutely not. We all stumble in many ways. I'm a fellow stumbler with you in this. I feel the weight of this. I wonder if you do. The verbal sins that I can go back in my mind as a Rolodex, and if I think about it too long, I can easily self-shame. Some of you may be thinking that too. The things that you've said to the person you've said it to, in the tone that you said it, you can feel the weight of this. You see a glaring immaturity in your life, and that is in reference to your words. The scriptures call me to honor my mother, and, and many of you know I've struggled in this, that my words have often revealed the dishonor. And yet I praise God for the spirit that is causing me to love her and honor her in very specific ways for the wonderful woman that she is and what she's done for me. I've been told to speak the truth in love in my marriage, but I've often spoken with pride and harshness to my wife, my bride. I've been told to not exasperate my children, to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That's what I've been told to do. But actually, I've, I've misused and abused authority to just get them to do what I want. You follow me, parents? I can be louder than them. I can be more forceful to get the kind of outcome I want. I've said, I'm sorry, please forgive me to others based on my words more than any other dimension of my life. I wonder if some of you feel that. Controlling the tongue is a top priority for the Christian given its connection to Christian maturity. If, if what you say, how you say it, to whom you say it, is not a priority for you in your passionate pursuit of Jesus, elevate it today. Bring it right to the top of the list. These are things I'm focused on. This is what I'm studying. Here's what I'm praying about. If it's not what you say and how you say it, to whom you say it, bring that to the top of the list. It's a top priority for us as Christians given its connection to Christian maturity. right? James already told us, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart. And this person's religion is worthless. Remember that? He's already told us to be quick to listen, to be slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Here he is again, pressing into maturity, and here again, concretely bringing us to what we say, how we say it, to whom we say it. It's a top priority for the Christian, given 
its connection to Christian maturity. And already all of your faces are telling me this, that you know something else about controlling the tongue. That it's an intense difficulty given its nature and effects. It's an intense difficulty. This is not easy. We know that from experience. But we also know that from the word. It tells us that. Look at what it says. It says our words have a surprisingly disproportionate power. He says if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. A bit. A horse. Talk about disproportionate, right? A horse is powerful. We measure cars by horsepower. Horses are big and strong and powerful. Bits, it's just a small little piece of metal. Very small. If you put a bit into the mouth of a horse, you can control the horse and the direction. He goes on to say, look at the ships also. Though they're so large, are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. There's a bunch of engineering that goes in determining the size of a rudder, given the size of the ship that it controls. Now, there's this whole discussion about whether or not the Titanic actually had a large enough rudder. I don't know. Go down there and measure it, the bottom of the ocean. Was it able to turn in time? Was the engineering accurate? Maybe that could have saved it. Whatever the case may be, you consider the size of the Titanic and the size of the rudder that was on the Titanic, there's a disproportionate size, and yet that rudder controlled the whole of the Titanic. He's saying, so also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. It's just a small part of our body, and yet it boasts of great things. We should beware of underestimating the power of the tongue. It is small relative to the size of who we are. But we should beware of underestimating its power. Proverbs 18:21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Did you hear that? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What we say Right? Is it just puffs of air that come off the throat and off the tongue? Is it just vibrations in our throat? That's all that words are? No, they're symbols that convey meaning. Maybe you've already heard me talk about this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Don't be confused about the power of this small member of your body. It's disproportionate in size, but it has such power. It can literally bring about death or life in relationships. You know that. You know that. It's hard because it has a disproportionate power controlling the tongue. But not only that, our words have potentially disastrous consequences. He goes on to say, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It's set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. And set on fire by hell. Just small fire. Devastation. We were in Colorado a couple weeks ago for the X-29 retreat. We had some things in the morning, some things at night. But during the day, we had opportunity to kind of check out Colorado, which was fabulous. And uh, we, we did it. We went whitewater rafting. Yeah, we did. It was great. It was actually some of the most picturesque things that, uh, scenes I've ever, I've ever had uh, my eyes on. But we went through this particular, we went down the Colorado River, and there were some heavy rapid times and some chill times, a lot of chill, just saying. I didn't pay for the chill, you know. So we're going down the river, and uh, you'd look up, and you, you'd see these beautiful, uh, it was so dry there, by the way, and you'd see all these black trees with no leaves all over the mountain. And I asked, you know, not wanting to assume anything, what happened? What do you think? Forest fire. No, I said, but really, what happened? How does this happen? Like, well, it can happen naturally. 
But actually what happened was, uh, if you understand uh, the highway system there, going from Denver over to uh, um, Vail and beyond, you go through the mountains, and uh, so uh, trucks would take that route, right, to, to bring uh, goods from one place to the next. And what happened was a, a, a huge semi uh, was dragging a chain for miles, just a chain. And it was bouncing off the tarvia, ting, 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 ting. And you can imagine how hot that was getting over time. And it was sparking along the way, and all of a sudden it just broke. And that chain bounced into the brush. And then you know what happens next. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres set ablaze by a small spark on the chain that fell into the brush. That's what words are, right? They, when, when, when we stumble in them, they're sparks that can set ablaze people's lives, can set ablaze relationships. They have such devastating uh, and disastrous consequences when we stumble in them. I think about this in the context of a marriage when uh, spouses can look at one another and say, the most hurtful, painful things, attacking their identity, uh, how they look, um, uh, can just devastate a marriage. Much of the counseling that I've been involved in over the years, if you could really break it down and see what's the issue here, it is a a massive distortion and breakdown of, of communication in a home. For sure, it can be we don't talk at all, That'll destroy a marriage. But when we talk, we say some of the most hurtful, painful things. And as you know, some of the just shortest phrases, phrases, a spark, can ignite a marriage. In the context of a family, right? Like when a parent looks at a child in frustration and says, you'll never amount to anything. As you hear countless stories about how fathers have said that to children and how that set their children on a course of just, of just not doing well, of mental health issues, that just words, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a sham. That just the smallest phrase, right? How about in the context of a church, right? We've heard over the last year where people in the context of the church, have gone after each other. Praise God, not this church. Now listen, in the context of renovation, we have not been perfect in the midst of this crazy pandemic with our words, have we? We've not been perfect. We've said things, and we've said things in certain tones uh, that have expressed the abundance of our sinful heart. We've gone after people. We've accused people, maybe on social media, just ever so quickly, we just type, type, click. Ah, raise your hand if you've had to delete things over the last 18 months. Raise your hand if you had to send I'm sorry texts and apology phone calls to people because you've been caught up in the storm of culture, the political, the racial, the economic, uh, the health, medical uh, uh, polarization, and you've realized you've literally gone after a brother and sister in Christ with your words because you have clung yourself to some sort of tribe that connects to some sort of political, medical, economic ideology that's more important than what God has done in the gospel to bring us together. Words. Praise God, we have sought to keep the gospel of Jesus at the prime, as the primary focus of this congregation. I want to affirm this church. It's not been perfect. There has been some. We've lost some in this. That brings me great pain. But understand, I look at the whole and see faithfulness in keeping the gospel central. But you can see that it would be easy to divide, that words can divide a church. Let us beware of that. Truth will in its moments divide, rightfully so. But be careful to distinguish between truth and your opinion about medical, economic, and political matters. 
can bring devastation. And finally, our words have a wildly uncontrollable nature, don't they? He goes on to talk about how you can tame animals, but you can't tame the tongue. I was thinking about this, uh, I think it was Tuesday night, I was heading, uh, after work, I was heading up to the camp uh, where my in-laws have a place up in Sandy Pond. I was heading up to see uh, my kids, and uh, I got in a, there's a backup, okay, in Brewerton. There's like sign, says huge sign, crash ahead, move to the left. And so I'm just driving, and being the amazing citizen that I am, I go left. And I patiently wait, you know, because I'm a patient man. And I patiently wait, and I'm just enjoying the moment that God has given to me, right? This is all sarcasm, just so you know. Power of words. So I'm just relaxing, and all of a sudden, some person just, like, going in the middle lane, huge sign, go left. Click, goes right, like, as fast as possible. And without thinking, without considering, I just yell, go left, moron. And I thought, there it is. That's wildly uncontrollable beast we know as the tongue. I chuckled. And I also felt shame. I have absolutely no control over myself whatsoever. Go left, you moron. I mean, I was right. Amen? And then the Lord brought to mind the 250 times I went right. And I thought, I should be more gracious. Nonetheless, we can't tame them. They just, they just respond. And, and, and when, it, when, the, when the tongue is not controlled and bridled, it just bursts out, doesn't it? Controlling the tongue is a major priority for the Christian. It's an intense difficulty. And I think at the very least today, as we're being confronted, care-fronted, God is loving us, but he's also pointing us down a path toward maturity that we can come before him today and one another and humbly admit that this is a major struggle in our lives. That that, that this is a, a, a way in which we stumble as the people of God. And and, and maybe at the very least today, if nothing else happens, we stop there this morning and we humbly come before our God and say, I need your grace in this regard. I need you. I can't control it. Your word even tells me, listen, let's just humbly, I can't do it, Lord. Not without your strength. I need your grace to control my tongue. It's an intense difficulty. It's a major priority. I need your grace, Lord. If that's all, if this morning you can just raise the priority and come before God and say, please empower me by the Spirit. Give me the grace that I need to say what needs to be said to who needs to hear it in the proper tone that all brings glory to you. We have won this morning. Humbly confess your need for grace. Ask him for grace. Ask him for healing. Because some of you are the givers of sinful words, but you're also the receivers, right? Hurt people hurt people. We've been caught up in this. We've been affected by this. Say, God, give me grace to heal. Because some of the words that come out of my mouth are, 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 are basically the eruption of hurt and bitterness and pain. And so while God would give you grace today to speak in a different way, to speak different words, I believe it would also give you the grace today to heal and to forgive those who have spoken sinfully against you. Ask for grace today. You can't do this on your own. No man can tame the tongue, but God can. Amen? Do you believe that today? Controlling the tongue is a top priority for the Christian. Controlling the tongue is an intense difficulty, but it also provides for us, as we seek God's grace and receive it from his hand, a wonderful opportunity to worship God and bless others. I want you to see that today. Controlling the tongue is a wonderful opportunity for us to worship God and to bless others. We have an opportunity to respond to our Father's gracious work in us. Right? All Christian ethics, all uh, works, 
are the fruit and overflow of what the gospel or God by his grace has done in us. And we have an opportunity to do that, right? With it, we bless our Lord and our Father. What an amazing thing we can do together, right? Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. That's what we do here every single week when we gather for worship. We respond to the gracious work of our Lord and Father. He has saved us. When we were dead and our trespasses and sins, he came to us and he grabbed us out from the bottom of the ocean and raised us up and set our feet on a rock. And when we come together, we pray and we sing and we, and we listen because of what he has done. Amen? We do not manufacture results on our own. It is a work that God is doing in us and has done for us. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. When you sing here and people overhear the melodies of your soul in words, it is a blessing to the Lord. It's a blessing to others. But there's an inconsistency, right? With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Man, oh man, we bless the Lord. We curse others. What a glaring gospel inconsistency for us. Some of you feel the tension of that right now. There have been moments where I have worshipped the Lord in such grace and patience and walked out of here and just laid into my kids in a car. And you feel that immediately. That's inconsistent. Some of you feel that this morning. With it, we bless God. And with it, we curse others. But we have an opportunity to bless others on the basis of the gospel. You see, natural human tendency is to treat people the way that they treat you. You say something mean, I say something mean, and I actually one-up you. Natural human tendency is to respond to sinful words with sinful words. Natural human tendency is when sinned against, sin against. That's how it works. You're nice to me, I'm nice to you. You're mean to me, I'm mean to you. You treat me like garbage, I'll treat you like garbage. That's natural human tendency. That's the DNA of society. If you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. If you say things, you get the point. But when, the, when God does something in the soul of a believer... That becomes the basis of how we treat him and how we treat everybody else, regardless of how they treat us. I was talking to a believer recently who was bemoaning the, the, the frustration that they had towards someone else. And the words that came out were just clearly hurt and, and almost like hate in their heart. So, yeah. And in the midst of all that emotion and trying to listen, right? I simply ask the question, what does the cross of Christ say to how you're responding? We're done talking about it for now. How does the cross of Christ change the way you speak of this, the way you respond to this? And I wonder if for some of us today, that would be an amazing thing to think about in reference to our words and how we speak to others, how we bless or curse others. How does the cross of Christ change the way we speak to others? Because that's got to be the basis. Not how they treat us, how God has treated us defines how we relate. That's the first question I want you to think about as we see this great opportunity to bless others. You say, I don't want to because they're mean. I understand that. I feel that with you. But that is not the guiding principle. That is not the foundation for how we treat people, right? We bless God for what he's done, and we bless others for what he's done. What does the cross of Jesus have to say about how you speak toward other people? Second question. How does the Spirit of Christ change the way we speak to others?
Back to fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Bridle. Bridle. Controlling the tongue. The cross of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. What about the Word of Christ? How does the Word of Christ change the way we speak to others? I find that the more that I interact with the Word and more I meditate on the Word, the more that that Word comes out in what I say. The more that culture has a voice to my ear, the more that my, my own sinful tendencies have a voice, the more just sin comes out in what I say. I had a conversation with, with someone recently about the kind of music that goes into our ears. I mean, I'm a big 90s rap guy. Okay? I said it. But edited versions. And some of you are like, oh, poor guy. Listen, what goes in comes out. We have to be careful. It doesn't take a brainiac to know what's under the beep. I get that. But we got to be careful. What goes in comes out. Right? What we eat all right, is, is a reflection of who we are. So we must feast upon and be nourished by the word continually. If the word of God goes in, watch and see, even surprisingly so, how the word of God comes out of us. What does the cross of Christ have to say about what you say and how you say it? What does the spirit of Christ have to say? What is the word of Christ? If you want to take those three things, the cross, the work of Jesus on our behalf, the spirit, the very presence of God living inside those who trust in him, the word, the, the, the word in which we, uh, that, that sustains us each and every day, that guides us, right? If you think about that, just that amazing, sufficient provision of God to his people, this is what changes you, this is what makes the difference. There's no provision lacking in you pursuing maturity, especially as it comes to your words. Let me say it differently. God has provided everything you need to grow in this area. The cross, the spirit, and the word. Not to mention the encouragement of the church, those around you. Right? Because if you hear the blessing from others, you give the blessing. It's, it's an amazing thing to think about. The full provision of God for us to walk in faithfulness. We have an opportunity to do what Romans 12, 14 says. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It's like the words of Christ on the cross. What did he say? Forgive them. The very people that uh, reviled him and cursed him. What did he say in response to them? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Sinclair Ferguson says, to say the right thing at the right time to the right person under the power and direction of the Holy Spirit is a magnificent grace in the life of the believer. Right? You need grace, and as we lean into it and live it out, it's just more grace. Calling you down a path to controlling your tongue is pointing you down a path to of grace and toward grace. What an amazing thing. You know people like that too, right? Those that you're around in the midst of the circumstances and difficulties of your life, it's just the word comes out. It's a word that encourages us and affirms us in our gospel identity and our calling. Jim Murphy is one of those people for me. Every time I'm around Jim Murphy, I feel encouraged in the gospel. It's just, just who he is. I think he uses his words to bless. I always feel revived and rejuvenated. It's a magnificent grace in the life of a believer to say the right thing at the right time to the right person under the power and direction of the Spirit. That's what James calls us to. A mature faith that manifests itself in a controlled mouth. May we be resolved to be a blessing. You may know of the Christian theologian Jonathan Edwards. As a teenager, 
he wrote resolutions. He wrote 70 of them. I want to read a few. Number 16, resolve never to speak evil of anyone. See that? He's, he knows. He knows about words. Resolve never to speak evil of anyone so that it shall tend to his dishonor, more or less upon no account except for some real good. Number 31, resolve never to say anything at all against anybody. But when it is perfectly agreeable to the highest degree of Christian honor and of love to mankind, agreeable to the lowest humility and sense of my own faults and failings, and agreeable to the golden rule, often when I have said anything against anyone, to bring it to and to try it strictly by the test of this resolution. Read it again in your own time. But the last one, and I find it interesting that the last one that he says is this. Let there be something of benevolence in all that I speak. Just leave that one up there. Let there be something of benevolence, blessing, good toward others in all that I speak. Could that be a resolution for us today? Because to bless God and curse people is a gospel immaturity and inconsistency. So let us be a blessing. Let there be something of benevolence in all that we speak. Because a mature faith manifests itself in a controlled mouth. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do need you. We ask for your grace this morning. We pray that the cross of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, and the Word of Christ would be a sufficient grace for us to walk in Christian maturity. I pray that your grace even now would inspire and it would heal. May your spirit lead us to be a people that bless you, that worship you, and also bless others on the basis of your grace. May we treat people on the basis of who, have, who, on the basis of who you have made them to be, children made in your image, and be glorified in our lives as we seek to be faithful and mature in all that we say. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.